Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And welcome everybody to this fourth uh, class in the series on the exploration of the holy science by Swami Sri Yukteswar. And this week we're going to explore, uh, I think what's a very central topic that comes up in the, that we take away from the holy science. And he, it's called the, uh, the heart's natural love, awakening the natural love of the heart. And so let's let's speak about that a little bit. But I want to I want to recapitulate a little bit of what we talked about in our last uh, week or two. And the soul's journey is one to escape suffering and ultimately to merge itself into divine bliss. And the pathway to do that is explained by Swami Sri Yukteswar as. Uh, we need to merge ourselves into the Holy Spirit, that holy sound of Om, uh, Brahmanidana, as it's referred to in the holy science. But how do we do that? And he begins by giving us four different ways that he describes that pathway of going into the, into the inner kingdom and merging ourselves in, in Om. And he says we need one, we need to have Shraddha. And he defines Shraddha as the cultivation of the heart's natural love. And secondly, we need to have Virya, which he defines as moral courage. And we need to have uh, Shmriti, which he defines as true conception of who, I, who am I, what are we doing, uh, uh, the reality in which we, we are faced and uh, how we go forward. And fourth, he defines as samadhi, which he defines as true, pure concentration. But of these four, the first two are probably, I wouldn't say the most important, but perhaps significant, especially for those of us who are treading this path, They're, because they unlock the other two. The other two, shmati, samadhi, they come naturally if we can uh, focus ourselves and accomplish, be successful in the practice of the first two, the awakening in the heart's natural love and moral courage. Now, you'll notice, of course, that he lists this awakening in the heart's natural love as the very first. And so let's explore that today. Now, in the holy science, if you've read it and if or you are reading it, you'll notice it's very cryptic. He doesn't explain he doesn't always tell you why, or he doesn't always tell you how, just in a very few short words. And it leaves us to us to be able to meditate upon that and try to explore for ourselves. And I'd like today, I'm going to offer a couple of insights or thoughts that I hope will be useful uh, for us. But first, let's, let's start with this, awakening the heart's natural love. Now notice it says natural love there. It's not something foreign. We don't have to create love. Love is there. You could say love is the essence of this whole creation of this universe. It's an aspect of God. And that resides within us already, but we have to awaken it. It's a natural thing. And unfortunately, we block it or we veil it, you might say, and it like it can become distorted. And oftentimes one of those, those distortions, of course, is emotion. And when people think of love, they often will think of that romantic feeling or the, you know, the emotional feelings. And of course, it's, you know, it's an aspect, I guess, of that, but on a lower octave. And what we're talking about is that highest octave that uh, needs to be awakened, that God-inspired feeling. And we're, we're speaking here about feeling. Now, why love and why the heart? And of course, we realize when we speak about love, where do we feel love? We feel it here in the heart. We don't feel it in our knee or in our elbow or some other part of the body. It's right here in the heart. And if we study yoga, we realize this is the center of the heart chakra, the anaha chakra. And of the seven chakras in the spine, it's the central one. It's the one right in the center. Those, it's said that the higher chakras, those above it, the, you know, the, we have the heart and throat and spiritual eye and the sahasra at the top of the uh, 
on top of the head. Those are the higher chakras often associated with spiritual aspects, spirituality. And the lower three chakras below the Anahat chakra, the first three chakras, are more associated with the function of the body, the thing, things of uh, this created, uh, created world, the outward world, and in a negative sense, you could say with the material world, and those things that pull us down. And you, the heart, because it's right in the center, you might say, is a fulcrum. It's that point where it can tip either way. We can have the feelings that we have can be upwardly directed, and those feelings can be downwardly directed. And so it's, it's that central point. But you could also say it's the Alpha and the Omega, I like that phrase, the Alpha and the Omega of the spiritual life. And the Alpha in the sense is because Swami Sri uh he had two very notable uh, quotes. They had many notable quotes, but two that are very pertinent and remembered. And I think all of us as devotees should remember that. And one is, it is with your heart. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Up, 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 up. It's uh, the, uh, the heart's Natural love is the principal requisite to attain a holy life. The heart's, and of course he meant the awakening of the heart's natural love, is the principal requisite. So it's, you could say it's the alpha, it's the beginning point. And he goes on to say, of course, it's impossible for man to attain the same, in other words, liberation, without it. You know, and, and so we have to have it. It's the beginning point, but it's also the ending point as well. As you read the autobiography of a yogi in that wonderful chapter where Paramahansa Yogananda goes into a state of cosmic consciousness, and right toward the end of it, he, he makes a very interesting statement, summing up, you might say, this experience where he says, I cognized the center of the Empyrean as a point of intuitive perception in my heart. This vast, you see the universes, the galaxies, the infinity, and he realized it all started at the Empyrean. And the Empyrean, of course, is a word, uh, means the highest heaven, as a point of intuitive perception in my heart. It all begins right there. And this is ultimately, we come to the conclusion right there. And of course, in the astral bodies, I said it's the center, it's the uh, middle, middle chakra, but it's also the center of feeling. And uh, feeling in the human sense, yes, but it's also feeling in the spiritual sense, that quality of consciousness, which is known as citta, the ability to feel, which makes us human. At, at that feeling aspect of consciousness. And the, that those feelings, of course, can be directed upward and downward. And in the downward, in that feeling sense in the, uh, which keeps us bound into this body, this chitta consciousness is expressed and very simply the way Paramahansa Yogananda expressed it, very simply as the likes and dislikes of the heart. And this is what you'll notice in life. We see something, something appears to us, we have an experience, and we cognize it, and immediately we attach a judgment to it. I like it, I don't like it. What's oh, a good thing? Not so good. This whole, you know, that, that we, we categorize it in an emotional way. And of course, emotional may means is relative to our individual being, our individual ego self. We we categorize it and we go through life in this way, and it's no and we then subsequently react. So it's the center of the reactive process. And when Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras begins that great scripture, how does he begin? Now we come to the study of yoga and defines yoga. Yoga is the neutralization of the waves and is how yoga is chitta vritti narod, neutralization of the waves of chitta, the waves of feeling. Now, this is not to, uh, I'm, now, don't go away with this thinking that somehow feeling is bad. Absolutely not. We have to feel. It's feeling which makes us human, but it's that emotional feeling of, you might say, reacting to something. A react to something begins right here in the heart, and the 
whole path of yoga is defined in that statement. We have to neutralize those waves and up and down. As long as there's waves up and down, it gives rise to egoic reality, likes and dislikes. And so we, we have to moderate them. Now, I, I, we ultimately, we have to neutralize them. That's true, neutralize, bringing everything back to neutrality. But in that neutrality is not unconsciousness and is not passivity. In that, in that neutrality, the door opens for us to be able to penetrate into reality on a deeper level and to merge ourselves into that inner sound of Om, which spontaneously appears. We open the door to that imperium, imperium. The door opens because it's no longer stuck in the dualities of life. And it opens and we enter into that inner kingdom and we merge into that. We hear that sound of Om and we begin the spiritual journey then of upwardly moving upward to the higher centers and ultimately to the highest chakra. Now, that's not the conclusion. That's the beginning. And this is for, for true yogis to begin the spiritual journey is to enter into that inner kingdom. And that neutralization is what uh, is the key to how to neutralize that. And how do we do it? Now, this is, of course, Swami Sri Teshwar doesn't go into very much depth of the how in practical day-to-day -day life are we going to do that. But that is our challenge. And But I do want to say it a second time. Feeling is not the enemy. We want to feel purely. It's how we direct our feelings that is the key. Because it, any any yogi, any great person is a person of very deep feeling. And it, it opens the door. And uh, 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 as I say, it opens the door to feel and to direct in the proper way. It opens the door for a deep, direct experience. Well, there's many, many things we can do, of course, to awaken that feeling in a positive way. And it's all the whole spiritual journey of sadhana are loads and loads of them. You know, the devotional uh, uh, practices that we can do, as Master said to Swami Kriyananda, he says, get devotion. And Swamiji, of course, I'm a, a as a young man, very intellectually inclined, he inclined. He began to practice all sorts, chanting, devotional uh, 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 repetition, mantras, all of these things in order to awaken that heart. And so it is with us as well. But in the day-to-day -day aspect, as we go through life, we can, of course, we can think of God. I found one thing that's been helpful to me, and I'd like to recommend it. And this is how do you neutralize the waves of likes and dislikes? You know, the problem with likes, and I'm not saying don't like anything, you know, it's, it's, it's in that way, in that literal sense, but the problem with likes is they lead to desires. A little like, uh, next thing it's a big like, and then it's attached, you, you become attached to it. And pretty soon you're, you've got attachments and, and, and you're, being, you're pulled out of yourself with the problem with that. The problem with dislikes, and that's one side of it, the problem with dislikes is that's aversion. There's a certain I don't like that. And, and there's negative feelings that come with dislikes. A little bit of aversion leads, to, or fear perhaps, leads to hatred, leads to, leads to, you know, shunning. And I've noticed that the dislike side of the likes and dislikes, they tend to pinch your heart. They tend to, you know, I dislike. And you start to close yourself off from the world around you. Those things you dislike and avoidance. And I've, and in, so what do we do? Now we have to, we can't just, you know, think we can just be neutral, but we certainly want to moderate those. And of, of the two, I've found that moderating and focusing less so on the likes, but focus on the dislikes, moderate the dislikes. And you'll find that naturally, you don't have to worry about the likes. You, it takes care of themselves because if you bring one down, it's a wave. Bring one side of the wave and the other side naturally comes into balance. And if you're going to pick two, I've found 
that moderating the dislikes is a better approach because we have to use techniques to moderate something. So rather, so countering a dislike, what do you do? You do something positive, right? If you're pinched, if, you're, if your heart is, is tightened with dislikes, I want to avoid that person. I, you start to pinch yourself. The opposite is a practice of expansiveness. The opposite is being magnanimous. The opposite is being, you know, joyful. It's, a, it's the opposite of the pinching. And so when we counter dislikes, we're going to have to affirm something. And the things you affirm are the positive things. Whereas in the in moderating the likes, you tend to it'll it'll you'll tend to have to restrict it. Useful. I mean, I, we need to be disciplined. We need to be self-regulated and all of those. But um, I find that the other side is is more useful. And so I also think I don't know this, but it's my it is notice how Swami Sri Teshwar he gives his one way to overcome the pinching of the heart, the mean is he calls them overcome the meannesses of the heart. Now, when I first heard that word meannesses, I thought, oh, that's, you know, being cruel, you know, being mean to somebody like that. But as time has gone by, I've actually think the better interpretation is mean means small, a person of little means a little abilities. It, it's a smallness of the heart. And that's what happens when we dislike something. It's the, it's the pinching and the smallness and the meanness of the heart. And if we look, look at those, look at those meannesses of the heart. And Swami Sri Teshwar, he lists eight of them. These are the things he says to help us be able to be expansive in our approach to life, in our in in, uh, in in to develop the larger heart, feeling heart, the, uh, is to get rid of those meannesses. And he, and I have a list here. It says hatred. Now we could give a whole lecture on each one of these, which I'm not going to do, but I'll mention them. Hatred, shame, fear, grief. The word he uses there is shok, which is, I think is sorrow. Condemnation, race prejudice, pride of pedigree, you know, that looking, you know, <laughs> looking down your nose. Or maybe the next one, a narrow sense of respectability. All of these things are negative. And so what do we do to counter them? We do the opposite. One thing is you balance them out. You do the positive things. Hatred, well, love. Shame, you know, in the sense of, of just the openness, forgetting the ego. Fear, courage. Grief, well, what's the opposite of grief? I think it's compassion for other people. You can know grief tending to think about oneself. All of these are rooted, these, these eight meannesses in the heart, if you look closely, they're all rooted in an ego consciousness. And if we learn to do the opposite, you see, and so in a sense, we moderate those negative things. And so during the, during the day, I had noticed in myself, if something happens is the natural thing is an experience will happen and the feeling of how do I feel about it will arise. It may not be obvious, but in the back of the mind or the back of the heart, that is there. There's a certain attitude of it. And if I notice, in a sense, I don't like it. It's, it's in, unpleasant. It's, uh, I, I back from it. I say, what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Relax. You know, why? And I notice it. And I think noticing something first is then the first step to being able to do something about it and release that and do the opposite, embrace it. You know, so sometimes you hear people say, oh, I hate that, I hate that, I don't like that. Or it's too hot, I don't like it. It's too cold, I don't like it. You know, I, oh, I, I, I'm, that person's wearing a ridge, I hate red, you know. <laughs> you know or people, you apply that to people, you know, unfortunately, people, people do that. They hate this, I hate that. And not, no, they don't really mean they hate it, but that, that's even the word. It, it, it's an aversion. Or, what is very, it's another word for aversion. 
we think we're averting, uh, you know, avoiding something, but really I think there might be on the at the base of those is fear. It's a fear. Oh, to be able to open one's heart to the world is what we can counter that. So this is why I say, I say, I found it just not to dwell on this too long. I found that avoid is, is moderate the dislikes and notice them. Wait a minute. And just, you know, and put out a little opposite energy. It slowly begin to, they begin to come into balance and the likes will take care of themselves. <laughs> you don't, you just, pretty soon you don't, you're not interested in those things anymore. They start to go away. And that's, you know, the many stories from Yogananda's life says, you practice this, do these things that I teach you and you won't want to do those things anymore. And that's the truth. Now, to get back, why is love so important? It harmonizes us. It brings harmony. Harmony, and there's even a question a little later I'm going to get to, somebody asked about harmony. Love harmonizes us with life. And it puts it, and when we're in harmony with life, isn't it? You love somebody and thinking in human terms, you're in harmony. Well, think of whole, all of life. Those likes and dislikes, you're in disharmony. You harmon, it harmonizes with, to be able to awaken that. And it brings us into a state of, a state of calmness and peace. And through, through life, you, or through love, you could say, we attune ourselves with life. And by attuning ourselves with life and ultimately attuned with Guru as well, the you know, God's will, you find, begins to be understood. We attune ourselves with God's will, with Dharma. And ultimately, in that process of attunement, there is no place for ego. It begins to dissolve. And inner conflicts dissolve, our own inner conflicts dissolve in, in love. And you could say... You know, people have all these problems, problems, problems. Love is the answer. Now, it's a cliche to say that, but, you know, cliches are truth, too. There's a truth to that. You, could, you know, the egotism, self-interest, those meannesses, those things that separate us, they begin to depart if we consciously try to bathe ourselves in that. And most importantly, perhaps, and this is what Sri Yukteswar says, the development of love, the natural love of the heart, allows us to attract the company of divine souls. And it allows us to attract and make us fit to be able to be in the company of our Guru. And now, if you think literally, well, the Guru, Maramats Yogananda, has departed from this body. But we're talking about attracting the company of the Guru right now. How do we, we want to see Guru come to me. What attracts the Guru into our heart right now? It's love. And it makes us fit to be able to receive that. If we don't have the Nart's natural love, we're, we're, high souls don't want to be there. They don't want to resonate on that vibration of ego. And so that, and you could say the universe itself that is extending a hand to help us in life we also block that. You see, we make we 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 close the door to be able to have that which we really need. And so it's she says, uh, uh, and it go, Sri Dashwar goes on with this quote. He says, "There grows within as we develop this natural love. There grows within the disciple a strong inclination to save himself and to practice seriously." And that gradually the eight meannesses of the heart disappear and virtue arises. And he then goes on to say, this is when one becomes a true disciple, a sadhaka, is when we've been able to do that. Because the real journey then begins when we've opened the door, the blessings can come in, Guru can help us, and then we begin the, the journey. Now, Second one that goes with that, I wanted to also cover and speak a little bit about, and that's that quality of virya, as Shri uh, Ji defines as moral courage. To develop this natural love is where courage comes in. Now, it uh, you know, at first, uh, uh, just in a human in a in a human context, it takes love. It takes courage to love, because to really love is we're letting go of a lot of those blockages within ourselves. We're opening ourselves. 
And that's a little dangerous, you know, you know, to, you know, to our feeling. We don't do that easily, but we know if any of us, if we felt love and in a human way, it does take courage. We open ourselves uh, to, you know, perhaps to other souls coming in and, and uh, knowing us on an intimate level, inner level. And to, and to even to purify the heart takes courage. It, it, you know, to do those things necessary to be able to allow love and to, to do those things necessary to conquer those meannesses of heart, take courage, to have faith, to not hate, to think good of something, others, uh, all of these things. It's a, it's a courageous act. And it, and and it's, 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 but it's ultimately up to us to have that willingness, you know, to be, uh, to be willing or to be, which even more is to be eager. And these ultimately, as I said, we start, you could say it's a little bit takes courage to start, but in the end, I think we get to the point where it's natural. It's the only thing to do. And I think coming to that point where Facing whatever it is, doing whatever it is that at first we think takes courage, we, I think we come to that point as all of us in human experiences, in spiritual experience, we come to that point in life, it's really the only way out. You have to face your demons, you might say, if you look at it that way, or you have to be able to allow life to proceed and, and uh harmonize herself with it. You might say it takes courage to eventually surrender. You know, surrender is thought of as a, something that might be for a person that's weak. But no, it takes a lot, a lot of courage to be able to surrender ourselves to something higher, to let go of all of those things that are, but, but what if, what if this, what if that? And then uh, courage, it, it takes it. And, and uh, Swami, uh, in the Holy Science, Swami Shri does, does give some advice on how to develop this, this uh, quality of vir virya. He says, directing one's love, and this is what he basically, <laughs> for the, he's writing for a very high soul, you see. Now, he's one of somebody who has a, a deeper understanding. The best thing to do to develop courage is to direct one's love toward the guru. And in the process of that, uh, everything is everything goes well. Now, obviously, why why is that? Well, if we direct all of our love to the Guru, we put ourselves in the Guru's hands, and we put ourselves in the protection of the Guru's aura. We allow God, and you could say God is the Guru. We allow God to be in His grace and to be able to surrender into that grace actually is what draws that grace. And so in a sense, it takes a great deal of courage to do that, but in the doing of it is how we develop courage. And we attune, you know, to that power. Of course, the, the, the literal power of the guru is what protects us. And there's so many stories of, you know, the Dr. Lewis out in the rowboat or in the little boat when the storm arises. He looked up, you know, into the into the spiritual eye and remember the Om vibration. He surrendered to God, looked and called on Om, remembering his Guru's instruction. When you're in Om, nothing can touch you. And if you have that reality implanted in you through experience, you can't be afraid of anything because you're always under God's protection. And of course, when you know that, what's there ever to be afraid of? You know, the old story of David and, Goli and Goliath says, oh, it must have taken David tremendous courage to go out there and fight Goliath. On one sense, that's true. But on another sense, it didn't take much courage at all because he knew he was in God's, he knew God's grace. He was felt God's grace. He was doing what God instructed him in a sense from inwardly guided him to do. And if you have God on your side, what else do you need? And so he went out there with full faith in God. And when we have full faith in God, since you could say that, you know, outward human courage isn't really necessary because we're in God's hands and that's the highest 
courage of all. Or he could say, where Krishna is, there is victory. And so Arjuna rode in Krishna's chariot. And yato Krishna tato ajaya. So secondly, I giving ourselves to the guru, drawing the gurus, gives us that moral courage. But to develop it, you know, now that, now how do we do that? You know, how do we in our daily life? Sri Teshwar does give us some hints. And one of them is, he says, the practice of the yamas and the niyamas. It's through the purification. And of course, all of the yamas and niyamas at their root are a neutralization of the ego. If you look at each of those yama niyamas, you'll see that ego is involved. And to the degree that we can get rid of the ego, minimize the ego, ultimately courage comes naturally. Why would it not come? Because God is there. We feel that inner harmony, that peace, that inner calmness that comes as we perfect. So practice of those, he says, practice of those, they are sacrifices. And this is uh, how he calls them. They bring purity. And as one develops, he's a, one is able, I'm quoting here, as one develops, he is able to concentrate his attention on the shushumna, that inner sound or the pranava sound. This comes as we develop those qualities. And from that, ultimately, the door opens and we're able to enter in to that inner kingdom. So these qualities, virya, and the development of the natural love of the heart, in whatever way you choose to do that, do that. And one thing will lead to another and you'll be guided in that way. And make this the priority. Many people think of yoga, they think of a very outer terms, you know, and I've got a, you can, you can do all the meditation you want, you can do so many kriyas, you can sit for hours, you can twist into a pretzel, all of these things, they have no value if the heart is not being developed. But done in the right way, with the understanding of what we're trying to do, then they can be helpful, they can be useless. But without the heart, it's just a matter of, you'll find what happens, you reach a plateau and you can't get off. And if you're on the plateau, take what we're saying today to heart. And I think you'll find an answer there. Now, I want to go to the questions that was raised last week. Swamiji said that attunement is harmony. How does that align with the fact that we will be faced with negativity when trying to make progress? You're going to have obstacles in life. And so consequently, how to have harmony. And sometimes also, it's impossible in, in an outward worldly sense. You could, you know, you look in the, you know, the news these days, and there's a lot of disharmony in this world. So you should you do nothing about it. Or And in our personal lives, there's often disharmony comes with no seemingly fault of our own. I mean, you could say that we attract our karma, attract certain difficulties, but difficulties and disharmony are not necessarily the same thing. And also the disharmony that we see and perceive outside of us does not necessarily need to lead to disharmony within ourselves. Harmony is for ourselves personally and ultimately in the larger sense also for the world at large is the solution for the dis, the, the dis ease that we feel in our day to day life. So yes, disharmony uh, uh, is not necessarily when everything is going smooth in life, but it's the inner feeling, the inner sense of of oneness, or the inner sense of of calmness and focus that we have within ourselves. And we need to, as a as a goal in life. We need to make harmony as a goal. Is it going to bring other people into harmony just by us being harmonious? For the average person, probably that's not going to be the case. But for a great soul, a great soul does bring on a very subtle level the great masters, the great saints and sages, the avatars who come into the world. They do calm the waters on a very subtle level that ultimately have an outward effect. But we 
can be harmonious within ourselves and strive for that harmony. I remember a wonderful story that uh, always exemplified this. And uh, there was a saint who uh, was chanting, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. And he was just so joyful. But he came into a town where that was not appreciated. And the, the Raja of the town uh, directed his soldiers to get him to stop. And he wouldn't stop because he just, he, that was his, his mantra. And he was so joyful singing it. And so he was, uh, the soldiers tied him to a tree and started to beat him. And the more he beat them, the more he sang. And pretty soon a whole crowd gathered around to watch this happening. And he was singing and singing until finally he was so joyful that the soldiers themselves began to feel inwardly. They began to feel joyful too. And they were beating him, but yet they were feeling the joy coming out of him. And they were too singing Hari Ram, Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Ram, probably while they were beating him until finally they were so overcome with joy, they were dancing in the street, as was the whole crowd. Now, I hope they lit him down out of the, out of the, from his lashes, but the, it's, and whether this is a true story or not, I'm not sure. But it makes a good image that his, his power was so strong that it influenced the crowd. And let's put it this way also. We live in a world of disharmony. What is our duty in the midst of all that? We have a choice in everything to do. We can join into the disharmony and you might say stimulate the waves that are, that are roiling the waters, or we can be an influence for the opposite. And we can, we can try to calm the waves. And we have to begin to calm the waves through calming ourselves. How do we react to it? And we have to do what's appropriate. Some, it's not always appropriate to sing Hare Krishna, Hare Ram. That might not be the best, more useful thing in any situation. But nevertheless, we do that which is useful to, to bring peace and harmony to a situation. And sometimes that can manifest in difficult ways, but it's what's inside of us. You know, if you're a soldier on a battlefield, you have to fight. But can you, at some level, do it in a way that's in accordance with Dharma? And this is, of course, the Mahabharata is a, example, a good example of this and Krishna's advice to Arjuna. So I know it's difficult. And even in, even you look in some of the stories in the scriptures, Jesus, he was well, not always peaceful and mild. He drove the money changers out of the temple. He brought a sword. He even said to bring a sword. But he didn't mean that literally outwardly to bring a sword. He brought the sword of discrimination, the, the fire of divine uh, uh, fervor to our own spiritual life. It was a sort of love, which ultimately is the greatest healer of all. And in the end, you would need to just look at results. What brings good results in your own life? What brings good results to you personally that you can, you know, you do something It's difficult. If you bring anger, you bring hatred, you bring all those negative meannesses to, to your life. Is it going to make you feel better in the long run? The answer is no. And unfortunately, it also brings a lot of bad results outwardly in terms of your karma. So think of it as a, in just in the practical sense. Harmony ultimately will bring the greatest fruits to yourself and also to the situation. I don't mean to compromise your ideals. Your ideals, uh, you know, to, to be harmonious is to you could say, don't, don't seek harmony out of, or your actions that result in your seeking of harmony. Don't let them be out of fear or cowardness or passivity in the, from a negative perspective. You don't want, oh, I don't want to create a, a fuss. You know, that necessarily isn't the right thing either. You have to do what's right. And, but do what's right in the highest, at the highest octave possible. This world is not made for perfect solutions. We're in the world, in a muddy world, and it's very difficult to act in this world without getting a little of that mud on ourselves. But 
we'd have to do our best. So I'll leave it at that. And unless bar, uh, bar keel, unless there are other questions, uh, I'm going to wait until next week. And we'll... Uh, there is a couple of questions in the chat, Jaya. Oh, okay. Uh, can you read one or two of them? Read one. Okay. Let me just quickly see. One is, um, how do I infuse my practice with love or devotion? Well, I think you, 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 you just do. You love. You know, like, that. don't approach your meditation and spiritual practice in the hope of receiving love. You're, that's the wrong approach. You have to give love. And so you have to love is, is, is in a feeling from the heart of surrender, as you could use, use that image, uh, of embrace, uh, of embracing. Uh, you could embrace uh, what it is, uh, uh, your, your sadhana. In, and this, you could say, this is a central question of the spiritual path, of your meditation, of your practice. How can you do whatever it is you're doing with love or in the spirit of love? And if, it, if it's helpful to look at images and the, look at the, into the eyes of the gurus, but you have to try to bring that to whatever it is you're doing. And if you bring that feeling of love and embraciveness, expansiveness, that feeling to what you're doing, slowly, slowly, you begin to cultivate it. It's a cultivation. The other day, just yesterday, I was planting some bulbs in my little flower garden. And they were, you know, there was nothing there, but I put them, I put them in. And what I'm going to do, I put some water on them. I covered them up with a little bit of nice soil. I'll come back and water them again and, you know, till it, it's cultivation. And that's the same thing with our spiritual path we cultivate. Uh, and so there's no magic formula other than love. And if some person might say, well, I don't know what love means. I don't think that's really true. You may be, and you, but we know it on a, on a lower level. Think of the different aspect. Love has a very high aspect, but it has a very day-to-day -day aspect. Kindness, graciousness, consideration for others, empathy, compassion. All of these are just other words for love on a different, you might say, octave. And if you can be able to it's not the compassion for the thing or the object or the person. It's the fee and that, but that may stimulate it. But then it's the feeling itself of, of including others in your reality in that way. So think of a way to uh, bring it down an octave as, as necessary. Second question. A person who has been illiterate in childhood and in anger has taken wrong decisions all his life and now in the space in his 50s a narcissist his family suffers because of his harsh behavior how do you help him open his heart so basically swanman who's been harsh all his life how do you somebody help him? somebody's been harsh well does the person want to overcome that harshness is that implied uh Bar it says, obviously, that how can you help them? Now, if the person yes. wants to be helped and is regretful of, you know, wants to, you know, put that in the past, well, everything in future will improve if we make the right effort now. Isn't that what Swami Sri Kiteshwar says? Every, we can't hang on to the past. We have to realize and we, and we say, oh, my gosh. I look back now and I did so. It's regret, in other words. They say that regret and desire are the two things that bring us back into life, karmically draw us back into lifetime after lifetime. And so the, the, but we have to make amends. If we can make amends, we do it. If we can change ourselves uh, right now and by what we do in the future, we do it. And we, so you have to, I think for somebody like that, it would be in that situation of give them practical solutions. And I think it starts with setting a new course in life right now. What's, what's, what's the direction? To realize we've made a mistake, you see, and then just concentrate on the mistake isn't going to help us get out. We have to say, okay, 
I made a mistake. Accept the fact that you made a mistake. Don't hide it. Don't bury it. But, but don't dwell on it either. Realize, okay, I've got to do something about it. I got to neutralize that mistake and I can do something in the future that's good. And so consequently, we start on a new path. And I think in that way, the mistakes will take care of them. The karma is going to take care of itself. But how that karma comes back and affects us is going to be determined by what we do right now. Now, it's uh, unfortunately, I is perhaps you have also met people that just dwell in the past. Oh, I did so many wrong things. Oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. I have those thoughts too. I wish I hadn't have done that when I was 20 years old. You know, it was a big mistake. I can't go back now, but I can send blessings to whoever it was I may have mistreated or done wrong to or, you know, or whatever it might have been. I can send blessings. And Paramahansa Yogananda said you can even mentally share, uh, you know, share your good karma if you have some uh, since then with that person you may have injured or done wrong to. Just just embrace them and, and sincerely from your heart to give them your good karma if you have some developed. Share that with them. In other words, they're gone perhaps from the physical body, but their soul is in the ether. And so you can embrace them in that way. But best not to dwell too much. Don't because you then you begin to identify and it takes your energy away from from focusing on what you can do good in the future. Okay. Gayaji, this yes, is sir. basically also them trying to help someone who is been like that, but they don't realize that they are that way, or perhaps they don't realize that they need to open their hearts, but there's someone well, close to you. You can just send bless send blessings. You know, if you start, you know, you see somebody, oh, that guy needs help, and you start jumping in and that's a little bit of impertinent in a way. You can't impose upon another person's free will. And of course you can, but you're, and the best way is through your own personal example of, of what is the right way to behave. But if some, you know, who are you to judge? And you don't know. And I mean, you have an opinion. And if so, I think sometimes it's best to keep it to yourself and then act in the right way to be a good example. But if a person, a person, all of us have free will to learn our lessons in our own time and in our own way, give that person the free will to do that, assuming this isn't some violent situation, but, uh, and uh, surround them with love. You know, love changes people. If you can love even the sinners, as Jesus Christ would say, you find you can change them. You bring them up to a higher octave where they see themselves. Oh, I don't want to be that way anymore. Is that how you've changed yourself? You look back and say, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. It's, it's painful to, to even think of being that way. And a person that's immersed in it hasn't reached that point yet. But you can, through, you know, through your company, whether it's physically or mentally or spiritually, you can help uplift that person and give them a good example to follow. So if you have further questions, and Barakil, if you have more questions, please do send them to me and I'll come back to them uh, next week to even uh, go further in these. So it's a uh, little past our closing time. So I look forward to seeing you next week for class five. I think I'm going to talk about next week a subject that Swami Sri Teshwar gives many pages to in his Holy Science, Natural Living. And I think that'll be an interesting subject. God bless. See you next week.